Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, recovering section 4.12, Induced Dipoles of Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, uh, second edition. I'm going to move fast, but you can always rewind. Thumbs up and share if you appreciate what I'm doing. As always, questions can go in a video response to the comments below. So let's get started. So what is an atom exactly? And as you probably know from different classes that you've taken already, there is a dense, tiny, dense, positive core surrounded by a an electron cloud uh, of electrons just kind of floating around in some uh, solid shape. And when you put this where there's no electric field, um, the two charges sit, they attract each other of course, and they just sit on top of each other, canceling each other. There's no net charge unless it's an ion, which we're not going to deal with right now. There's no net charge. And um, the monopole term of the potential is zero, the dipole term is zero, everything is basically zero. So what happens when you put this in an electric field? Well, let's say we put an electric field pointing to the right. So we're going to have, remember these are tiny, so it's very difficult to get the electric field to change on the size of an atom. Um, so the positive charge in the middle is going to move with the electric field, and the negative charge on the outside is going to move against it. Now the actual motions are tiny. They're, they're so extraordinarily tiny that you would wonder how we can actually detect it. It's, it seems almost magical that you can, but if it weren't for the fact that dipoles behave the way they do, especially pure dipoles, we wouldn't be able to notice these effects hardly at all. Um, now, if you, if you turn up the electric field to a certain point, you'll actually pull electrons off of this atom. Those free electrons will basically turn the material into a conductor. This is what you get when you see lightning, for instance. Air normally doesn't have free electrons roaming around, but when you have an intense electrical field, then all of a sudden electricity will flow through the air. Um, the other strange thing that happens is that um, when you form this dipole, there's uh, a sort of uh, electric field that opposes this electric field um, in the immediate vicinity. But uh, it produces a very interesting electric field when you put everything together, as we'll see in a minute here in, in a couple of sections. Um, sometimes you'll have the the um, what, what's the right way to put this? Oh, when you when you have many atoms together, sometimes you'll have like you can look at a a, a dipole moment for a unit volume. We'll, we'll cover that more in detail as well. So let's look at example one. The oh atomic polarizability. So the distance it moves. So basically, you can calculate this. You can get the electric field is equal to um, the alpha of the electric field. Huh? So basically the dipole moment induced by the electric field, there's some proportional constant alpha. Mm, is it proportional for the entire wave? Mm, who knows? There's, there's different um, ways that it behaves, but this is a pretty good rule of thumb. Uh, this is a very tiny number, by the way, because of the intense, the small movements that we see. And, and the, there's a table at the top of the chapter four there that you can look and see how small this motion is. Anyway, example one. I've been wasting too much of your time already. So example one. So we're going to go with a very simple uh, model where we have um, a solid sphere. I'll kind of draw it this way to, to let you know that it's solid. Okay. And inside the solid sphere you have a positive charge. Um, and the solid sphere is negatively charged, uniform density. Um, so it has an equal opposite to the to the, the, the positive charge on the inside. And the question is, given this model, what is our alpha, right? So we're going to submit this to some electric field. It doesn't matter how much. We're not worried about ionization. And we're going to see how much these things move, right? Now, the electric sphere on the surface, because we're moving such a tiny distance, we can safely assume that it's going to remain spherical, even though this is more of an egg shape. But anyway, so how do we how do we see how far that distance is going to be, that the, the, uh, the, how far they get apart from each other, how far, they, well, the positive charge moves away from the center. And the answer is if we can balance the forces, then we're going to reach an equilibrium point. And if the forces are balanced, then that must mean the electric field produced by the negative charge is balanced, is exactly opposite the electric force that the, the particle was submitted to. So let's calculate, given a distance d away from the center, how much electric field there is within this solid sphere of charge. This is awfully like problem 2.12. So if you haven't solved 2.12, I encourage you to go back and solve it yourself before I show you the solution. Seriously. It's a good, it's a good exercise. 
Okay, so how do you how do you calculate how much the electric field is given a certain distance around? Well, we're going to draw a Gaussian surface of radius d around the center of this negative charge. We're going to calculate that the integral along that surface of e vector dot dA is equal to one over epsilon naught times the total charge enclosed. That's Gauss's law in integral form. Now, because we have symmetry in our favor, the electric field is always going to point, you know, uh, parallel or anti-parallel um, with the area vectors, and so we basically get E is equal to the integral of dA, or E dA is the same as this integral, and what is the surface area? Well, that's this uh, 4 pi, and the distance is d squared. 4 pi d squared, I believe that's correct. Check my notes. Yes, it is. Okay, and that's going to equal the charge enclosed. Well, how much charge enclosed? Well, that's going to be equal to um, the charge density, rho, times the volume. What's the volume? 4 thirds pi d cubed. Well, what's the charge density? That's the total charge, q, little q, divided by the volume of the sphere. So we get that's equal to 1 over epsilon naught. Uh, 4 thirds pi d cubed divided by 4 thirds pi a cubed. A is the radius of the atom. And so putting these together, well, we can cancel out some numbers here. And cancel out that, cancel out that, cancel out that, cancel out that. And you can cancel out two of these, and you have one left behind of the d. And so you get the electric field is equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Where did that come from? Who knows? Um, d. Oh, I forgot the Q here. That's the total charge of the sphere. Q D over A cubed. Okay? We're not quite done yet. We want to relate the, the dipole moment P with the electric field and see what the constant is there that we have to multiply electric field by to get the dipole moment. And if you look really closely, what's the dipole moment look like? Well, that's just the charge times the distance of separation right there. So multiply everything, we get 4 pi epsilon naught a cubed e is equal to qd, which is the dipole moment, the magnitude of the dipole moment there. And this bit right here, that is the alpha. And if you look closely, 4, pi, four thirds pi a cubed is the volume of a sphere, of that electron cloud sphere that we just calculated. So we have, uh, very simply, that um, three of these volumes times epsilon naught is equal to the alpha, oh, equal to the alpha constant, which, you know, for most atoms is well within about four times of what we expect to see. A uh, final note, for molecules, when you have more than one atom connected together, uh, let's take carbon dioxide, for instance. You have three spheres, two oxygens on the side, and a carbon in the middle, how big they are, it's I guess they're roughly similar in size. If you subject this to an electric field pointed this way, the dipole moment that goes along in the, the perpendicular direction to that is actually quite small. It's much smaller than the dipole moment if you go in the same direction as the axis. And so for this one, the dipole moment would have to be equal to uh, the perpendicular component times the electric field that's perpendicular to that, plus the, the, the parallel uh, coefficient times the electric field that's parallel to that. And in this kind of case, if you have like an electric field that's pointing at some combination of perpendicular and parallel, the dipole moment is not going to be in the same direction as the electric field. Okay? And also for more complicated molecules, you can get this general equation here where you have the dipole moment is equal to some matrix, um, a tensor actually, where you have alpha xx, alpha xy, da 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 da, all the way to alpha zz times the electric field vector. Okay? And this tensor, um, he has a note in the book that if you orient your, your coordinate system the right way, you can have the tensor described by just three values rather than nine, which makes life a little bit easier. Um, we call that the axis of uh, principal polarizability, actually. So anyway, that's what happens when you have more complicated configurations. I hope this helps. I um, hope it wasn't too confusing. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye.